does it mean to be a sister of St. Basil? We're called by Christ to be women of prayer imbued with Eastern spirituality and filled with that to go out and serve people of God. як це все почалося. Дійсно, ми можемо е, вже в перспективі того часу, столітнього, побачити силу духа і велич тих людей, тих, тих, е, тих піонерів, тих першопрохідців, які, направду, принесли світло Христового Євангелія е, е, в ті наші громади, які так тоді його е, потребували. Coming to America in those days was no great option. If you had a career and a life going on in Halachana, you did not want to come to the coal regions of Pennsylvania or the factories of New York, not knowing the language, being a stranger in a strange land, far away from the people that you love. In those days, there were a lot of accidents in those coal regions, and there were a lot of orphans, and the, the orphanage in Philadelphia, a lot of the children came from the upstate region. There were explosions in those mines and all. And, and of course, the, the, the families were not two, three. The families were like five, six, seven, eight. In 1907, Bishop Bortinsky had a diocese of half a million faithful. There were a total of 60 million plus Catholics. His diocese was number seven. You need help. Bishop Ortinsky turned to Metropolitan Sheptitsky in Ukraine seeking assistance. The Metropolitan went to the sisters, the Major Superior in Yavariv, and asked for assistance uh, to have the sisters come to the United States to assist Bishop Ortinsky. <laughs> на якому вирішено цю справу, що подобна ігуменія Сафата зазначила, що е, ординарій застеріг право повороту, як і відкликання трем сестрам, котрі мають виїхати з Америку для е, утворення дому, інституту, школи не, і школи. Іменно Єлені Лянгевич, Пафнуфі, Тимошко і Єфимії Курилас. Сестри, котрі виїхали до Америки, власне, виїхали з цього монастиря, що є в Яворові, який ми зараз тут бачимо. Якщо, скажімо так, поглянути на те, як відбувалася оця місійна діяльність нашої церкви, наших священників, наших сестер, зокрема, сестер Василіянок, ми побачимо, що тут Одна або дві особи запалювали тисячі сердець. І очевидно, що вони повинні були горіти тим Духом Святим, 
мати ту свою церкву у своєму серці, щоб можна було її привезти тоді на інший континент земної кулі. From the beginning, from, from Basil's time, we have always been attentive to the needs of the time and to serve, no matter what it might be. There's a difference between you deciding what to do and you saying, this is where God is calling me to do. This is what God is asking me to do. It's not comfortable, it may be difficult, uh, but the fact that you see the will of God here to make people's lives better, you go where you are sent. And so I think the sisters looked upon this as a spiritual call from God through the bishop to serve people who needed them. These young women came and daily responded to the will of God. And in that way, we see the results of that today. We are sitting on land and in buildings behind which and under which lie the many sacrifices, but more important, the many acts of dedicated love for us. This is the reason they came. Once the sisters arrived, things began to come together. They opened a school within one week. The children came. They were being prepared for First Communion. They were beginning to learn the language of the nation that they now resided in. The parents felt safe and secure. They, 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 they felt that their children were safe and secure, which, which gave them more confidence in what they were doing. happened with Greek Catholic or Ukrainian Catholic orphans? They would be sent to various state-run or private-run facilities, many times which were not Catholic. And these children would be lost to the faith, and they would also be lost to the community. Uh, who would help take care of these children? The sisters. I was raised by the nuns from, I think, 1941 until 1954. I came to the nuns, uh, and this story comes to me from Sister Augustine, that my mother couldn't take care of me. She wanted to give me up for adoption to a Protestant family. Somehow she got wind of that and said, no, 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 Joey, you can't, uh, they, you can't let this child uh, be raised a Protestant. He's Catholic. So that's how I got to come to the Sisters of St. Basil in Chesapeake City. I would say somewhere from about 1930, to 1942, I was at St. Basil's Orphanage. Uh, Wednesdays and Fridays, we would get kasha. And these boys who came from a family home didn't like it. So for nickel, I would eat it. Red beet soup, they didn't like it. I would get 10 cents to eat it for them. In order to finance their ministry, they opened up a carpet weaving shop a printing shop, and they made vestments. I do recall the printing house. They had a beautiful printing house. They did uh, calendars and books and missionar. They did all the printing. And I remember Sister Modesta uh, and Sister Constance. For those sisters, I will say, they were not great theologians, but they were not such дуже духові, молились і дбали, за, і, і то все було наше, і вони молились, дбали, і були такі духові люди, духові жінки, тяжко робочі. 
During my tenure there, I can recall one of the greatest moments of my life in having met Sister Miletia, one of the most holy, pious, spiritually enabled, blessed by God, none that I've ever served in that convent at that time. I remember her kindness, her gentleness, and I would say that if there were anybody to be emulated at this time, at this 100th anniversary, it would be Sister Valetia. So we had a sister that used to walk around in the basement, you know, and she didn't go to bed so early. And uh, so she came to us and she said, you know, there's on the corner, you know where the road goes to the house and this way, on that corner. And th the field was a cornfield. So they took the cobs and made a cross and they put it on fire and they put their masks on and they screamed, you know, yelling. But we didn't put any lights on or anything. We didn't tell Mother Joseph it. we didn't want to scare her. The KKK had burnt a cross on their front lawn in Fox Chase, not wanting these Catholic nuns to come into their territory. But she said, well, we looked at the cross, and we went to bed and got up the next day and continued our work. Uh, it was sort of a, a resilient way of looking at things that even though they may have been scared or they may have uh, not even known perhaps maybe why people would be against them, they got up, whether people were good to them or not good to them, and then continued to work for the church. The Sisters of St. Basil's the Great were essentially, from my perspective, the, the social uh, hub of the Ukrainian community. The Ukrainian community has always built itself out from the center, and at the center was the church. The first things we built when we go somewhere is a church. The second thing we built is a bar. It's usually located right next to the church. The sisters were able to offer a third pillar uh, that was everything from schools to festivals to, to workshops to, uh, to activities that, uh, that united us, that kept us together. They were women run by women at a time when most of the women in society depended on their husbands. And here you had women who were independent. You know, there was no man that could tell them what to do. Even the bishop, which is the highest ranking person in the Catholic Church, had to ask them. Mother Marie called me in one day. So it was Mother Josephine and Mother Marie and myself. And I had no idea why I was being called. And Mother Marie said, we're going to open a college. I said, what? She said, yes, we're going to open it. I said, what kind of a school is it going to be? And she said, well, you better think about it. I was in Pittsburgh teaching the eighth grade. I was a principal in Pittsburgh at the time. I was frightened. But I said to the Holy Spirit, I said, if I'm told to do something and I feel responsible to obeying, you better do the work. I told him that. <laughs> at the academy at the time, we had Christine Dochwat, the one who uh, decorated the entire cathedral here in Philadelphia. She's, she knew art from the time she was born. So she made our seal, and it's there to this day the seal of Manor College. You had St. Basil's Pillar of Fire, then you had St. Macrina's Acorn of Courage. The education at St. Basil Academy was great influence on my life uh, because of the, uh, I would say, of, of discipline, which was very important, of example of the sisters, and of perseverance, of um, everything that a young woman should know, it became my path in my life to follow.
I had not thought of entering the Sisters of St. Basil until I guess it was my junior year, beginning of my senior year, because my one big desire was to be a nurse, which did not come out the way I had planned it. But again, God has his ways. I love to teach. I just, I think that's who I am. And when I get into a classroom, all my desire to, I wanted to be a Broadway singer and dancer, but that didn't come to fruition. So I, I enjoy teaching for that reason. I just love to teach. Even as a little girl, I enjoyed prayer life. And what struck me about our sisters was not only the encounter that I had with them in school, but also that I would attend liturgy on Saturdays. And what struck me was their spiritual life, their prayerful life. And when I would look at them in church, it almost seemed as if they were just so united with God. And that peace and that serenity affected me very much. I had initially wanted to be a nurse and I had my application for Henry Ford Hospital Nursing School. But it was on a holy Saturday that I went to church and uh, for the blessing of the baskets and went to the tomb. And there I saw one of our sisters, Sister Salome actually, who was preparing the altar for Easter. And as I sat there, I sincerely prayed to the Lord, asking the Lord that he inspire me as to what his will for me might be. They only taught me for three years in grade school, St. Nicholas in Chicago, because I had been attending the public school. But I was very impressed that the sisters were there for the students before school started. They were there during recess time for them. They were there after school. I didn't find that in the schools that I I had attended before. So, and then I was very impressed with their dedication to the young, to the people in general. And so impressed that that's what I wanted to do with my life. And I have. At Manor College, I, the, the greatest impact was um, the spiritual aspect of really seeing the beauty of worship uh, in our tradition. I really came to love on my own, a Byzantine rate. Um, we had many things that we did, uh, not only liturgy, but the rituals of, in various areas of processions and uh, special prayers to Our Lady. I went to Immaculate Conception through Grand Canyon School and High School. So I went there from kindergarten to 12th. Then I taught there as a lay person for seven years. Then I entered the community, and then I went back to teach as a sister of St. Basil there for another three and a half, four years. So I have a long history with the school there. Well, when I entered, uh, uh, my parents came in three months and asked me if we want to go home because the people were saying such stories that the, that the sisters sleep in a, in a tomb and all that, you know, and they came and they said, listen, we want, if you want to come home, we're taking you. And we said, no. <laughs> when I entered the convent, I was told I was going to go on in my studies. They were, uh, and they told my parents, because my parents said, we don't want her to go to the convent. We want her to continue her education. She's a good student. So she's going to the University of Chicago. And my dad said, she's not going to the convent. <laughs> After this 25th anniversary, we made arrangements to go visit my niece, who had moved to Irving, Texas. Uh, I had never been on a flight with my mom, but we were on the plane, cornered in somewhere with seat belts and conversing before the plane took off. And my mom said, Znaiz Joen, ja dumala, to vše dvajče pět rokiv, te bylo v monastiri, te jim služila, pomahala, te pervže čas, šeby ty prišla do domu, i zi mnoju bute. I was like, oh my God, where was this coming from? And I cannot get out of this seat. My first day here, arriving to attend boarding school, I just became so relaxed because the sisters, the sisters were so relaxed. 
The sisters were so pleasant and welcoming and made me feel so much at ease. So I, I did grow to love the sisters and I loved boarding school. I loved being here in Fox Chase and I never wanted to leave. My mother didn't want me to come because she was afraid at those days. You didn't know what was behind closed doors and she, she really wasn't sure if what they were going to do to me behind. And so when she came for the first, I'll never forget, the first visiting day in October, she looked at me and I had gained weight because she really didn't think they would feed me here. I had gained weight and she smiled for the first time in her life. When I gained weight, she smiled. And she opened the trunk of the car and took out all this Halloween candy because she wasn't really sure if we ate, but she was sure then. So then she kind of, I know that when she saw me in October and she saw I was happy and I lasted one month, when she went home, she sold my piano and all my clothes, everything. She sold everything. I had nothing left. So I guess she knew I was going to stay. I remember that the first year, I guess, you were still, you still had the, the old, old habit. habit. Mm -hmm. I also had your eighth grade. Mm -hmm. I know. And then the f next year, the year, the first year that you came back with the new habits and you mm -hmm. had legs. <laughs> so excited. You had hair and you had legs. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I remember, I think you probably noticed all of us not looking at you, but looking at the legs. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you said something. You said, yeah, yeah, we all do have them. Fox Chase. And it was already in the Sobor. In the village of the Sobor. And the sister there started to change the habit. The sister in different habits. I były tam takie siostry przysutni z Union tam. I znajdę ja taką małą takie, że pisze to i propowiedzi, że po południu nauki to było możliwość pytać. Siostry chodziły. I tam jedna taka siostra każe, a co wy dumajecie pro habity? Jaki powinny być habity siostry? Znajdę, a tam różni, taki, że duży moderny, taki troszkę moderny, taki znajdę tylko zresztą. Zasa, znajdę, jak teraz proszę siostry, ja mają swoje dumko pro habity, ale ja wam nie skażę, bo ja chcę zbicy wyjdzie żywej. <laughs>
і там провадили школи, і то була надзвичайно важлива діяльність. Бо це властиво те, що втримало нашу церкву. Бо були люди, які ходили до тих парафіальних шкіл, а пізніше вони, я розумію, що залишалися при парохії, і в той спосіб парохії жили. Я би то називав така золота доба українського католицького шкільництва в Сполучених Штатах в тих часах 40-ті, 50-ті, 60-ті, 70-ті роки, де сестри відіграли величезну, величезну роль в цьому великому проєкті виховання нашої католицької молоді при парохіях. Це велика, велика їхня заслуга. The nuns really had a had a difficult job because when I entered into the eighth grade, uh, it, the th- I guess it was the third wave uh, had come to America, and and our eighth grade class was so large that Sister Theodosia had to split it into two. So I guess we had classes from like seven in the morning till noon or something like that, and and then the the second group came in after that. And, you know, at that time, it, it didn't mean anything to us except the fact that we had, quote, a half a day of school. But when you think back onto, you know, the administration, you know, the constant teaching, the different groups of teaching, uh, you know, Sister Theodosia, uh, not, not to single her out, but she was my eighth grade teacher, really had a tough job. And, mm-hmm. and we didn't make it any easier on her. We were the largest school in the Archdiocese of New York. The superintendent of the Archdiocesan School, even though we are not strictly part of the Archdiocesan system, but that superintendent, he couldn't get over the fact that there were so many children here and he wanted to come and see if we really had 1,200 children because no other school in the Archdiocese had that many children and we were the largest school at that time. It, it, it was a good setup, and all the boys knew how to get into the uh, classrooms even though the doors were locked. So, uh, typical New Yorkers. <laughs> we had classes in the corridors, in the closets, in the hallways, wherever they could put us. And it was an incredibly joyful and incredible time that we lived through those times. And I think the Bazillion sisters not only gave us the skills for our daily life, but they also fed us and taught us spiritually what had to be done, how life had to be handled, how to pray. They prepared us for First Holy Communion. They prepared us for high school, college, and life. Without the sisters, the school would not have existed. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and attended Immaculate Conception Ukrainian Catholic Church in Hamtramck which is a suburb of Detroit, and attended both of our schools, the grade school and the high school. Uh, I remember the two years when Sister Dee was uh, teaching me uh, in uh, sixth and seventh grade. We must have been a pretty difficult class that uh, we received the same teacher in the seventh grade also. Well, uh, not really, because you're a very gifted class, very unusual class, and, and if you remember, your classmates, uh, they went on and they're lawyers and physicians and bishops, etc. cetera. Um, and so it was a very, very gifted class and they needed to be challenged. And that was the challenge. The, the sisters um, were a, a great asset uh, for the educational system in Detroit. And, um, and they really put, um, for example, the high school on a very high level. Uh, most of the graduates uh, went on to college. So it was, on, it was put on a very high academic level, Immaculate Conception High School. I always say the Sisters of St. Basil the Great are a teaching order. This was a vocation, but this was a gift. This was something they wanted to do. And you could see this in the Sisters. They would go out of their way to meet with students. They would give lessons or they would uh, correspond with us through the summer. There were a lot of things that they did that went outside what I call the box. They didn't need to do it, but because they were who they were, 
they did this and they never asked for anything back. Uh, it was just a, a very honest giving from the sisters. There were many of us who came in 1949 and um, I came in, uh, uh, in April. So we were in Sister Patricia's class for two months learning the alphabet and to read and write. In St. George's and in Fox Chase, most of us were immigrants, and we weren't treated as second rate. We were treated as being very, very important, and, and we were expected to pr perform and achieve. So we weren't like, oh, you're second rate. You were not second rate. You were, you were first rate. Having had that kind of nurturing on the one hand and that role model that you're part of something, you're important, you can achieve, made a big difference. The nuns were always polite, uh, always good, always smiling, always intelligent, always well-mannered. And that is something that, you know, every young girl looks up to and wants to be like that. Poised, knew everything, knew how to answer every question, knew how to deal with every situation. Not like we were awkward, you know, we didn't know it was either oops or all oh, heavens, what did we do? Oh, yes, definitely. I remember, you know, the dedication uh, of the sisters. They really lived uh, um, a life of total giving in great poverty, I would say, compared to, you know, what, what we know is uh, luxury today. Um, and uh, the Brazilian sisters were part of the great American phenomenon, North American phenomenon of religious educating young people. I started at St. George School from kindergarten and uh, the education I received here from the sisters uh, enabled me to be on stage as a conductor first in kindergarten, which is now what I am here in the church. Uh, I also uh, started dancing a little at the school uh, which is uh, what I did for a number of years teaching Ukrainian dance and still do uh, every summer. The memories I have really, I think, kind of shaped my life to a, a great extent in that they taught us a love for the church, a love for God. In fact, they taught us how to pray, which was uh, very important. That, of course, we couldn't appreciate it in those days growing up as kids, how kids are. My graduating class only had three boys and three girls, but uh, and Sister uh, Nianiri was our teacher, and I, I do have very fond memories of her. In fact, many years later, we, a group of us from St. George's went to visit her. The words that she said to me when she realized who I was, she said, I thought you'd never grow up. <laughs> you know, as an attorney, you often um, get challenged your ethics get challenged. Your client may tell you something, may do something, may behave in a certain way that isn't acceptable. And you have to think it through legally, you have to think it through spiritually, you have to think it through morally. And ultimately, you either look at ethics as something, you know, what, where's the line of, of stuff that you can get away with, and what's the real line of the right thing to do. And I think the elemental, not think, I know that the elemental education about faith and about ethics that I received from the Sisters of St. Basil's were the core of my decision-making process when I got into difficult ethical situations or difficult ethical, had to resolve difficult ethical issues. And then there was Sister Damien. Once a week, I would take a little shopping cart and I would go shopping with her. You have to understand, I'm now a buyer for the Dominican Priory of St. Pius V in Chicago. She taught me how to do that. Everything that I now do, the sisters taught me. I was quite active in St. Nicholas, and um, I remember in sixth grade when Sister Bernarda came into our classroom, looked around, said, you and you come with me. And that was myself and another girl from my class and immediately took us to the auditorium. We started playing the bass. And I was a member of the orchestra from that day on and it was a wonderful experience. Sister Ignatius, 
welcomed us to the first grade and gave us her opening speech. It sounded like this. Children, everything you do from this point on will go on your permanent record. If you do well, that success will follow you around all your life. If you do poorly, however, well, that will drag you down wherever you go. Why, just last week, the chairman of the board of General Motors Corporation called me up and he said, Sister Ignatius, did you have little, let's call him Johnny Capusta in your class? for reading? And I said, yes, yes, uh, I, I remember that. Yes, I did. And what grade did he receive for reading in grade one? Oh, and I, I said, uh, unfortunately, Johnny only got a C in reading. I remember particularly my first day in first grade when my father, who was a professor, uh, understood how important it was for teachers, especially sisters, to have students that are cooperative. <laughs> and so I remember him grabbing me from the car, and in one hand he's holding my hand and pulling me vigorously up the stairs, and in the other hand he has what appears to be a belt. <laughs> And he walks up the stairs, and there's Sister Neonelia, and she meets us at the doorway. Well, said the chairman of General Motors Corporation, we were about to offer him the position of executive vice president for international programs. But now, knowing his sordid past, that he only got a C in grade one in reading, I guess he'll have to be a bum for the rest of his life and will never get a job. And my father says to Sister Noanelia, Sister, this is my son, the fourth one to come to St. John's. And I want you to know, and I want him to know, that whatever you say goes. <laughs> and if there's a problem, here's the belt. <laughs> Use it liberally. <laughs> so you see, children, everything you do from now on goes on your permanent record. <laughs> and it was my first impression that coming to the school was not a chance to wiggle out, but it was simply going to continue uh, to be disciplined, to be taught, to be kept in line. And I'm grateful for that because... Uh, throughout my life, I, I know that this has had an impact on me, that the sisters were able to continue what my parents had started. So Sister Ignatius kept us in good order and set us on our way to lead successful, positive, constructive lives, because otherwise, anything we did would follow us around for the rest of our days. We always thought the sisters had eyes in the back of their head, and they always knew what's going on. They had the plan. They knew your plan for that day, because they, was, they were always there before you got to wherever you were going to, to cause trouble. They were always there for some reason, so we felt it was a conspiracy. <laughs> Don't trouble trouble until trouble troubles you. <laughs> so it's just be very qu quiet now. <laughs> I, I want peace and quiet now. <laughs> and that was it, you know, and the class would have to be quiet, and, and we would be pretty much most of the time. So I've learned to know the sisters a little bit differently professionally, um, learned to respect them for all that they've given up for their mission and for the belief that leaving the world a better place than you found it, the philosophies of the school, the philosophies of St. Basil the Great, they absolutely permeate throughout this building, and not just with the students, but with the employees as well. 
I was a very young, brand new teacher in the classroom when I started here. My experience with Eleanor has uh, really been wonderful. Anytime I've asked her uh, to help out in anything, she was always there. Uh, and it's, it's a wonderful feeling for an administrator when you have people that are willing to go the extra mile. But Sister Carla has let me grow in many ways as a teacher. And I feel the same way because when I started, I was a very young teacher also, and Sister taught me. And as I said, that was, that was very challenging for me to come back as a, as a teacher after being a student, a graduate. You know, in high school is a challenging time, and I can see that now being a teacher of high school girls and thinking about when I was a high school student and how hard it is. You're trying to find your place in the world, and um, the sisters that I did have, and Sister Rita for religion, and Sister Suzanne, and Sister Carla for Spanish, uh, seeing them teach in their different subject areas, their presence always brought forth, you know, God's word to me. And I was drawn to that from the very beginning. When you're a teacher today, it's not just imparting knowledge. Uh, you have to be um, a friend and a, a guidance counselor and uh, a mother and so on, and you really have to embrace the total um, person. The model of the sisters that um, I witnessed as a student and growing up at St. Nicholas uh, is what I try to put into my own image of what I should be as a teacher. I always keep in mind that I need to make a difference in other people's lives and in following the saying of St. Basil, leaving things better than I found them. And that's something I also repeat to my students. I was a young person who had no interest in education and had no desire and no ambition to, to be educated. I worked in a factory, to, I worked in an insurance company, and then my friend decided to go to Manor College, and then I thought that might be a good idea. I would say Manor College changed my life. And I, I would repeat what a uh, present new member of Manor's Board of Trustees whose daughter graduated from Manor, that Manor saved her daughter's life. Well, in a sense, Manor changed my life direction completely. The nuns had a profound influence on me, especially uh, a sister Olga. At uh, UKU, at the Ukrainian Catholic University, uh, where Patriarch Joseph was living uh, from about 1980 to his death in 84. In the afternoon, he would come out to get a little sun and a little fresh air. And Sister Daria and I would uh, always um, come, come out there uh, and just be with him. And it was always interesting how he teased Sister Daria. Uh, um, Sister Daria had a very kind of friendly a uh, human and the light relationship uh, with Patriarch Joseph. Uh, Mother's Day pilgrimages here, they were the best. They were the best. I mean, they still have them, but they have them in October. But they were they were one of the most most nicest things that they ever had. Because you, you, you had people from all over the world come here. Everybody was here. If you didn't see them after graduation, that's when you saw them. The sisters are looking for different ways of outreaching to the community. Um, I think particularly of the youth programs that are being um, established in the uh, Bazilian Institute, um, the Spirituality Center. Even now, with we're doing the icon writing workshop, this year we have three. We've had Roman Catholic, Ukrainian, Ruthenian, we've had non-Catholic, and they all formed a community to feel a sense of church, real church. I graduated from Manor Junior College in 1980. It was there where I was first introduced to the Ukrainian liturgy. And it was also there where I first became interested in icons and their beauty and praying with icons. Uh, most recently, I wrote an icon, The Mother of Tenderness, which I presented to the Patriarch in Chicago this past September, and it was an awesome experience. My father was an orphan. I suffered very, very much, 
and I thought of the sister, uh, children in Ukraine. And somehow I got permission from the superiors who agreed, and that's how I started. When I saw Sister Bernarda after many, many years at a benefit for the orphans in Ukraine, before I left that evening, I told her, I have to do something with you to go to Ukraine. And from that day on, for the next six years, I've been going to Ukraine with her because I've learned from an earlier time in my life when I was in school that one saying that everybody out there, you can make a difference, one child at a time, one person at a time. Probably, I will never forget Voroch Ide, written by, I believe, Sister Laura of the Bazillion uh, Order. Metropolitan Andrew Shevtitsky, in his words, in his homilies, which were captured by Bogdan Lepke, uh, Metropolitan Andre said, Kolish was kresne Ukraina, was kresne vstane Ukraina, and we are witnesses to that today because Ukraine is resurrected. However, Ukraine is still hoping to be able to firmly stand, and that is a struggle, but it's also a blessing because they do know they have the prayers of those who went before them in the form of Metropolitan Andrei Shaptitsky and all the martyrs of the country who actually have shed their blood for Ukraine. And so I totally believe, and that's one of my favorite passages, I totally believe that, was Kresnevstane Ukraina. And I have that same passion. <laughs> сестрі Доротеї, яка дуже багато спричинилася до нашого турне, музичного турне. Це дало також пізнати нам краще провінцію Христа Чоловіколюбця, пізнати краще всіх сестер. І я можу сказати, що це, ця провінція, вона дуже близька нашому серцю. Близька тим, що сестри, які пам'ятають цей свій вихід з Яворова. І це дуже цінять, це дуже підтримує також нас любити свій чин, 
любити свою історію. І я би сказала, що це є дуже для нас такою великою підтримкою, заохотою, щоб ми любили нашу історію. Це тепер, до, тепер до останніх часів сестра Дія, яка дуже багато зробила для укріплення сестер тут після тої комуністичної навали, що вона тут багато зробила перед нею. Була тут сестра Емелія також, яких я знав з Америки. В 90-му році «Свобода» прийшла до Східної Європи, і майже всі країни, всі країни точно, скинули ярмо комунізму, і ми могли мати доступ до сестер. Почалася праця на горячо. The church was traumatized. Uh, there were different points of view in, in religious life, you know, sisters who make the radical move towards monastic life. They all have character, and uh, monastic life is like a tightrope act. And you know, sometimes people slip, and there's a lot of can be a lot of tension. And uh, Mother Dia was, I think, uh, will go down in history as a, uh, a general superior of a very important period in transition. And I, to, to this day, I'd like to take her counsel. Підтримка сестер за кордону, споза поза меж України для нас була дуже відчутною. Бо в той момент, коли ми при виході з підпілля відчулися дуже розгубленими, ми не мали доброї інформації, ми не мали добре поставленого спільнотового життя. Сестри за кордону, зокрема мати Емелія, була послана до нас на Україну, щоб сформувати провінцію, щоб згуртувати добрий новіціат, добру формацію. Тут ще нам дуже багато треба зростати, але те, що ви були прикладом і допомогли нам будувати духовне життя, внутрішнє, спільнотове, ми це дуже-дуже сильно доцінюємо. It was interesting to see the different groups evolving and coming back together um, and helping them in their formation. Uh, the young sisters uh, telling them what it's like to minister to people in parishes and what they need to expect, how they need to prepare themselves to do the work of the church. So I think we did a lot by just even being a presence to them in Ukraine because they hadn't had that community experience which we helped provide to them, which I think was very important. In the mid-90s, I was asked by our superior general to um, go to Ukraine, to ivano Frankivsk, to serve as dean of the school a school, the Catechetical Institute, to prepare the young women there to serve as teachers of religion and catechism in the schools in Ukraine and in the parishes. Sister Theodosia was very honest. She said, you know, come uh, and see, because we were looking to establish the Ukrainian gift of life. She said to us, well, you know, just have lower expectations and just come and enjoy the people and you'll find what you need to find. You know, even though we don't have direct contact with them anymore, even though they're not a daily part of our lives, they're there when you need them. Uh, and they're, they're willing and happy to, uh, to serve and, and to help. And uh, they, in this case, they certainly were a key part in starting an organization that uh, that has saved the lives of 500 children. What I value now, uh, particularly in what I see you know, today's youth lacks, uh, is the kind of catechesis that uh, a different time gave. And the catechizers were the sisters. Often in Catholic history, religious education or catechesis was thought of as something that was done for children. And here you have children that grow up to be adults, and they deal with grown-up situations on a 7th or 8th or ninth grade level. I think the sisters are moving more into making sure that catechesis 
the knowledge of our faith is put, placed on a level for the entire family. Probably the most uh, intriguing um, and, and most critical uh, ministries that the, the Brazilian sisters are offering now are trying to generate an interest among our, our clergy, first of all, and the people that they serve in the parishes with the program, the Generations of Faith. The Generations of Faith is a program that encompasses uh, all ages, from the youngest to the oldest. It builds a sense of parish uh, community, family, the parish is a community, church is community. And, and so we're indebted to the sisters for providing that leadership in, within our church. And particularly now as the new catechism for our church, Ukrainian Catholic um, uh, Church has just released its uh, the, 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 the catechism program, and it gives immense, tremendous material for use in this Generations of Faith program and in all catechetical approaches that we'll continue to offer our faithful to build the kingdom of God here on this earth. Las hermanas basilianas de Filadelfia y las hermanas basilianas de Argentina han trabajado en varios proyectos por el bien de la Iglesia de Brasil, Canadá y Roma. En el año 1951, la madre Sofronia Aldeli, cofundadora de las hermanas basilianas en la Argentina, trabajó en Filadelfia por la centralización de la orden en Roma. Y en la actualidad, ambas provincias colaboran en la difusión de la espiritualidad bizantina oriental a través de los medios de comunicación con el proyecto Generación de Fe para las Iglesias Orientales y el Centro Basiliano Kenosis Comunicaciones. Нещодавно відвідуючи сестер в Америці, я була збудована такою вашою, дорогі сестри, молодечістю духа, тим, що ви, ви продовжуєте з величезною наснагою, з величезною відданістю служити Христові. Там, де ви є, все, що ви робите, то є неймовірно прекрасне. І це будує мене, нині сестру Василіянку в Україні. Я так з цілого серця бажала би усіма способами, якими би можна тільки було вам віддячитися за це. І я вірю, що всі сестри в Україні будуть намагатися зробити все-все-все, щоб вам бути дійсно добре і дуже вдячними. I hope uh, uh, to see in sisters those that are in the avant-garde that can be for us priests also kind of a source of support um, to fear, not to fear that the numbers are small. Jesus had only a few disciples. You know, they've done so much, so many vocations throughout the hundred years. You look back at the early history uh, and how the sisters came. Uh, Bishop Ortinsky invites them to come and invites them to respond to the tremendous amount of people's needs, basic needs, orphanages, children needing care, people needing education, catechism, to, to, to be comforted in, the, in their loneliness, distance from the home, uh, from their homeland. All the different ways they responded immediately to human needs. The congregations came together, the parishes came together, they built the beautiful churches that we're gifted with. The sisters built the communities, the, the families, the individuals, they, they built the spirit within all those communities. And they, there were many vocations. They responded to serve. They, 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 they looked at the sisters. They wanted to model after them. They wanted to continue to serve the people. And it's been a tremendous gift in these hundred years. The many young women who have joined the order of St. Basil the Great, the sisters, and, and offered whatever gifts and talents that God uniquely gives to each of them to be able to provide for, for his holy church. Today the Brazilian sisters are a testament to the human spirit and embodiment of Eastern Christian spirituality. Carrying on and building upon the legacy of their predecessors, they continue to be guided and inspired by the love of community, heritage, learning, prayer, and service. 
At our last chapter, we have barked upon a pilgrim's journey to transfiguration, a legacy of hope, committing ourselves to be true to our Eastern tradition, to reverence the sacredness of all creation, and to take seriously our relationship to God, self, and others by experiencing personal transformation.